Imagine trying to walk just, I don't know, a few blocks maybe. But every single step brings this searing, just debilitating pain in your legs. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're dealing with something like a wound on your foot or your toes that just refuses to heal no matter what you try. Right. Those are really worrying signs. Exactly. They aren't just like minor inconveniences. They're critical signals that something fundamental might be going wrong with your body's, well, its most vital plumbing system your arteries. Precisely. So today we're taking a deep dive into a complex and really life-altering medical intervention, aorto-bifemoral bypass surgery. It's a big one. It really is. And this isn't just a big medical phrase. It's a major procedure designed to restore crucial blood flow when it's desperately, desperately needed. Yeah, when the body can't get enough blood where it needs to go. Our mission today is to really understand this operation mm -hmm. inside and out. We'll explore why it's performed, what it truly involves, um, and the critical factors you need to consider. And we're drawing this from detailed medical sources, right? Mm -hmm. Including insights from a vascular surgeon. Exactly. The goal is to equip you, our listener, with clear, essential knowledge so you can understand such a significant medical decision. Let's get started. Okay. So the underlying story here often begins with a condition called atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis. Yeah. Yeah. This is essentially a disease where... Um, Abnormal fatty material, it's called atheroma, slowly coats the inside of your arteries. Okay. It's a bit like, you know, plaque slowly furring up old pipes. It narrows the flow until eventually, maybe it's just a trickle. So it's that buildup then which causes the arteries to narrow or harden, mm. basically reducing the amount of blood that can get through them. Exactly. It reduces the flow. And when this narrowing affects the arteries in your legs, that's when you start to really feel it, isn't it? Absolutely. This narrowing in the legs leads to what's known as claudication. Claudication. Yeah, it's pain in your calves, your thighs, sometimes even your buttocks, especially when you walk. And what's really crucial to understand is that it becomes a strong indicator for, you know, maybe needing surgery when that pain limits your walking to less than about 200 meters. Less than 200 meters. Wow. Mm -hmm. And as the condition gets worse, it can cause pain even when you're just resting. Even at rest? Even at rest. And eventually that, that diminished blood supply can lead to really serious issues like ulcers or even gangrene in your toes or feet. That's a really stark picture. Now, if this clogging process is happening in your legs, does it connect to other parts of your body? I mean, is it just an isolated leg issue or part of a bigger systemic problem? Oh, it's definitely not isolated. Atherosclerosis is the same underlying process that drives other major health issues. Think heart disease, stroke. Right, the big ones. Exactly. And the risk factors that contribute to it are pretty common things. Smoking, high blood pressure, having a family history of atherosclerosis, just getting older, uh, diabetes, and high cholesterol levels. So a lot of familiar factors there. Yes. And what's truly striking is how preventable many of these risk factors actually are, yeah. which makes, you know, personal lifestyle choices a critical line of defense, even against such complex conditions. That makes sense. Okay, so... Having clearly understood the root cause, this atherosclerosis, let's turn to that pivotal moment. When does a situation like this escalate to needing something as, well, as significant as a bypass? What are the accepted indications for this surgery? Well, the need for an aorto bifemoral bypass is typically signaled by a specific, quite severe condition. Okay. These include things like an abdominal aorta aneurysm that's a dangerous bulging in the main artery. Right, I've heard of those. Or gangrene of the toes or foot. Huh. Persistent rest pain in the legs, that pain even when you're not moving. A non-healing ulcer on the foot. Or, as we mentioned, that claudication that's so limiting you can't walk more than 200 meters. So those are the really clear, severe signs. Those are the points where a surgeon would seriously consider the bypass as the necessary intervention. Yeah. But a major surgery like this, so it isn't something anyone just jumps into, right? Are there less invasive alternatives they look at first? That's a critical consideration, absolutely. For less severe cases, sometimes exercise can help. Exercise. How does that work? Well, it can encourage the body to develop alternative ways for blood to flow. We call it collateral blood flow, little side routes, essentially. Ah, uh, okay. Like natural bypasses. Kind of, but it can take many months to develop, and even then it might still not provide enough blood flow to really fix the problem. Got it. What else? Another option is an angioplasty. This involves widening the artery with a small inflatable balloon. Right, threading a balloon in. Exactly. And often they follow that by inserting a stent that's a little metal mesh tube 
to help keep the artery open. But that doesn't work for everyone. No, this approach isn't suitable for every patient. It really depends on the precise location and the severity of the blockages. Sometimes the blockages are too long or too hard for it to work well. Okay, so the natural follow-up question then is, what happens if this bypass pathway isn't taken? What are the stakes of, say, declining the surgery? Right. Well, if the operation is declined, your doctor will certainly focus on managing those risk factors we talked about, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, mm -hmm. and they'll prescribe blood thinning medication. But it's really essential to understand that the blood supply to the legs might just continue to reduce. Despite those measures. Potentially, yes. Yeah. Which can lead to more frequent pain, worsening ulcers on your feet. Oh, dear. And if gangrene develops, it could ultimately mean amputation of the leg or foot is needed. Amputation. That's incredibly serious. It is. And a crucial point that comes up again and again in the sources is smoking cessation. Stopping smoking is absolutely essential in trying to prevent this deterioration. Right. So given those serious potential consequences, if surgery is the chosen path, what does a patient need to do to prepare? And then maybe you can walk us through what actually happens inside the operating room. Okay. Preparation is absolutely key to the success of this operation. Number one, if you smoke, stopping immediately is crucial. You mentioned smoking is a cause, right? It's a primary cause of the problem, and it significantly increases the risk of the bypass failing later on. Stopping even just weeks beforehand can dramatically reduce complications and improve the long-term success of the graft. Okay, stop smoking. Yeah. What else? Are there less obvious things? Yes, some vital steps. Patients are usually advised to increase their fluid intake to prevent dehydration. Okay. And to stop any anticoagulation or antiplatelet drugs, basically, blood thinners, but only as advised by their healthcare team. You don't just stop those on your own. Right, under medical advice. Definitely. Maintaining a healthy weight, if possible, and engaging in regular exercise can also help prepare the body for the stress of surgery and help with recovery afterwards. It sounds incredibly meticulous. I've also seen advice like... Um... Avoiding shaving or waxing the surgical area in the week before. Yes, that's to reduce infection risk. And keeping warm. And for diabetics, really managing blood sugar levels tightly. Absolutely. Keeping warm helps blood flow. And good blood sugar control is vital for healing. Plus, bathing or showering beforehand. Again for infection. Exactly. It all reduces the bacterial load on the skin. Yeah. It really emphasizes this sort of holistic approach to preparation. Hmm. Every little bit helps minimize risks. Okay. So the patient's prepped. What about the surgical journey itself? What happens in the OR? Right. The operation is performed under general anesthetic, so you're completely asleep. And it can take quite a while, anywhere from, say, 90 minutes to maybe even seven hours, depending on complexity. Wow, seven hours. It's a major undertaking. The surgeon will make a long cut on your abdomen. Or in the belly. Yes. And also cuts over each common femoral artery in your groins. Those are the main arteries in the upper part of your thigh. So what are they actually doing with those incisions? What's the core mechanism of this bypass? How does it work? Okay, so the ingenuity lies in how the bypass functions. The surgeon will carefully clamp and then open your aorta. Remember, that's the main artery carrying oxygen-rich blood from your heart down towards your legs. Okay, clamp the aorta. And then they sew a synthetic graft in place. It's usually made of a material like Dacron or PTFE. Think of it like building a new highway around a massive traffic jam caused by the blockage. A detour for the blood. Exactly. The lower ends of this Y-shaped graft are then carefully tunneled under the skin down towards the groins. Okay. And then they're sewn onto your common femoral arteries, usually below the blockage. This allows blood to completely bypass the block sections and reroute flow through the new graft down to the legs. Ingenious. And they use antibiotics during this? Yes. Antibiotics are typically given during the procedure intravenously to help reduce the risk of infection, which is a serious concern with synthetic grafts. And during such a long, extensive surgery, how are they keeping such a close watch on the patient? What kind of monitoring is used? You're constantly monitored with various lines. There'll be a drip, an IV, in an arm vein for fluids and medication. Standard stuff. Yes. Possibly a central line, which is a bigger IV, often placed in a neck vein for giving certain drugs or monitoring pressures more directly. Okay. An arterial line, usually near the wrist, gives beat-to-beat real-time blood pressure monitoring, which is critical during major vascular surgery, right? and a catheter in the bladder to measure urine output, which tells them how well your kidneys are doing. All these ensure maximum support and vigilance throughout the whole procedure. 
It's clear it's a very involved process. Yeah. Now let's talk about the less comfortable but absolutely necessary part of any major surgery, the risks and then the road to recovery. Mm -hmm. We know risks are often higher for, say, older or obese patients, smokers, or those with existing conditions like diabetes, heart disease, or lung disease. That's true. And understanding these risks is really essential for informed consent. It's a serious operation. So what are some of the general surgical complications people should be aware of? Well, like any big operation, there's a risk of bleeding. It affects about 1 in 20 patients, and sometimes it might require a blood transfusion. Okay, 1 in 20. Wound infections are also possible. They're often treatable with antibiotics, but sometimes need further procedures. Allergic reactions to medications or materials, though rare, can happen. Hmm. And there's a risk of acute kidney injury. It's usually temporary, linked to the stress of surgery and blood flow changes. But in a small number of cases, maybe it could lead to chronic kidney disease down the line. I was quite struck by some of the stats for things like DVT and PE in the sources. Deep vein thrombosis, a blood clot in the leg, around 1 in 100 people. Yes. DVT is a risk. And the more serious pulmonary embolus, where a clot travels to the lung about 1 in 150. Can you shed a bit more light on those? Absolutely. These are important to highlight. A DVT, the clot in the leg, or a PE, the clot in the lung, is a serious potential complication with any major surgery, particularly one involving long anesthesia time and periods of immobility afterwards. So what should people look out for? Patients are definitely advised to seek immediate medical attention if they experience sudden shortness of breath, chest pain, or if they cough up blood after surgery. These could be signs of a PB. Okay. And chest infections? Yes. A chest infection is also a general risk after anesthesia and surgery, which can slow down recovery. Getting mobile early helps prevent this. Right. Okay. So those are general risks. Now, moving to the specific complications for this particular bypass surgery, what are the unique challenges or risks here? One really significant risk unique to this procedure is graft failure or blockage. The bypass itself failing. Exactly. It can happen early on, soon after surgery, or much later, even years down the line. Yeah. And the sources suggest this affects a considerable number, maybe one in three patients over the long term. One in three. That's that's quite high. It is. And that one in three statistic isn't just a number. It fundamentally reshapes the long-term journey for a significant portion of patients. It really highlights why that post-operative care and follow-up is just as crucial as the surgery itself. Absolutely. What else is specific to the bypass? Well, there's also a risk of weakening at the point where the graft is sewn onto the artery. This can lead to a bulge called a false aneurysm. The risk is about 1 in 100 over 10 years, and it might require another operation to fix. Okay. Graft infection is another really serious concern. The risk is quoted as about 1 in 10 over 10 years. 1 in 10 for infection. That sounds high, too. It's a significant long-term risk because it involves foreign material, yeah. and it can be very dangerous, potentially leading to a life-threatening connection between the aorta and the bowel called an aortoenteric fistula. Wow. Yeah. It's why surgeons might coat the graft with antibiotics and why that pre-op shower or bath is recommended anything to reduce infection risk. Understood. And what about things like nerve damage or other maybe less common but still severe issues? There's a risk of embolus where a little bit of fatty material or clot breaks off during the surgery and travels down to block smaller arteries in the foot. Okay. Fluid collection under the wound, called a seroma, can happen in maybe 3 out of 200 cases. It usually just resolves on its own but might need draining. Mm -hmm. Nerve injury is possible, too. It can cause numbness around the wound or sometimes down the leg. Often temporary, but sometimes it can be permanent. Okay. More severely, though much rarer, is spinal cord ischemia. This is where the blood supply to the spinal cord itself gets damaged during the aortic clamping. Oh, that sounds critical. It is very serious. The risk is estimated around 1 in 400. It can lead to severe nerve damage or even paralysis. 1 in 400. Rare, but devastating if it happens. Exactly. And for men, there's a specific risk mentioned related to erection problems. The sources indicate about three in four might experience this. Yes, that's a common concern. Is that always a direct result of the surgery itself, or are there other factors involved? That's a really vital distinction to make. While the surgery itself can cause damage to the nerves and small arteries in the pelvis that are important for erections, okay. for many men undergoing the surgery, the underlying atherosclerosis may have already caused these issues even before the operation, simply due to the reduced blood flow. So it's not always the surgery causing it anew. Ah, I see. The problem might pre-exist. It often does. And finally, and this is crucial to be aware of, 
There is a risk of death associated with this surgery. The figure often quoted is around 1 in 20 or 5%. 1 in 20. Yes. This is a major operation, and that risk is higher if you already have other serious medical problems like severe heart or lung disease. It really underscores the gravity of the decision. Absolutely. So once someone gets through the surgery, having navigated those risks, what does the recovery path typically look like? It sounds like it's quite a journey. It is. The initial recovery usually involves one to two days in an intensive care unit or perhaps a high dependency unit for very close monitoring right after the operation. Okay, close watch initially. Then you'll typically transfer to a general surgical ward. Initially, you'll likely be on bed rest, getting fluids through that drip, and maybe only allowed small sips of water. Right, taking it slow. Very slow at first. Then, over the next few days, you should gradually be able to start moving about more, sitting out of bed, walking a little, and returning to a normal diet as your gut function returns. And all those tubes and drains. Yeah, the drains from the wounds, the IV drips, and the bladder catheter are typically removed after about two to five days, depending on progress. And when can people usually go home? Discharge from hospital is usually around seven to ten days after the surgery, assuming no major complications. Okay, seven to ten days in hospital. And then... <laughs> Getting back to normal life, when can someone expect to feel fully recovered and resume their regular activities? Full recovery, feeling sort of back to yourself, usually takes about six weeks, sometimes longer. It varies. And what are those crucial next steps for long-term success, keeping that graft working? Well, it's absolutely crucial to follow all the instructions given for blood clot prevention. Mm -hmm. That might involve medication, like injections initially, or wearing special compression stockings. Okay. Regular exercise is really important too once you're cleared to start. Gentle walking, gradually increasing, helps with overall recovery and cardiovascular health. Your healthcare team will give advice on this. What about driving? Good question. You shouldn't drive until you feel you can fully control your vehicle, including performing an emergency stop without pain or hesitation. And always check with your car insurance provider about their specific rules after a major surgery. Right, practical points. And the good news is, most people can return to their normal activities eventually. And crucially, your surgeon will likely prescribe long-term blood-thinning medication, usually something like low-dose aspirin or clopidogrel, to help keep the blood flowing smoothly through the graft and ensure it lasts as long as possible. Lifelong medication, potentially? Often, yes, to protect okay. the graft. Okay. We've covered a huge amount today. We began by understanding how atherosclerosis that sort of fatty buildup in the arteries. The clogged pipes analogy. Exactly. How that can lead to debilitating leg pain, those non-healing ulcers, and even grimly gangrene. Mm -hmm. And then we explored how this aortobifemoral bypass surgery offers a crucial lifeline when those non-surgical options just aren't enough or aren't suitable. We detailed the specific severe indications for this complex procedure. And we didn't shy away from the details, the meticulous preparations required beforehand. Stopping smoking being top of the list. Absolutely. Then the intricate journey inside the operating room with its synthetic grafts and that careful rerouting of blood flow. And critically, the array of potential risks, both general and specific to the bypass. And finally, that step-by-step -step path to recovery from the ICU right through to getting back to daily life, hopefully with much improved circulation. The value of this knowledge for you, the listener, we think is immense. Whether you or perhaps someone you know might face such a decision one day, or maybe you're simply curious about the frontiers of modern medicine. Yeah. Being well-informed is really your most powerful tool. Medical decisions, especially the big ones like this, are deeply personal. They require a comprehensive understanding of the potential benefits, the definite risks, and all the available alternatives. It really is quite humbling when you consider the incredible precision and, frankly, years of training required for surgeons to perform a procedure of this magnitude. It truly is. And what really stands out is the ingenuity of it all. Modern medicine allowing these procedures that can profoundly alter a person's life trajectory. You know, restoring mobility, preventing devastating complications like amputation. Yeah. And this leads us to maybe a final thought to leave you with. While medical science continues to advance at this incredible pace performing these amazing feats, how much personal responsibility must we as individuals continue to take in managing those chronic conditions, those lifestyle factors we discussed? Right, like smoking, diet, exercise. Exactly. And how critical is that continuous open dialogue with our healthcare providers for getting truly personalized care that weighs all these complex factors? It's a journey, really, that we're all on together. 